Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Dirk. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, our own, well, recently completed polar trial and specifically how this uh, trial supported my dissertation project titled Towards Understanding Therapy Response in Chronic Aphasia. I'm going to give you a very brief background or my motivation for this project leading up to the study aims. I'm going to spend the bulk of the time talking about the methods and the results and then some discussions for these results and future directions with this project and onwards. So as Dirk mentioned, I have a clinical background. I am a speech language pathologist. Um, did fairly well in my graduate study. Uh, and as an SLP, I primarily work with people with aphasia. Now coming out of grad school, my idea of what aphasia therapy would look like was something like this shown in the graph here, that if you would administer therapy over time, the client would gradually get better. Uh, as you probably most are well aware, and as I realized pretty quickly when I started actually working with people with aphasia, this really, really isn't uh, an accurate description of what aphasia therapy looks like in real life. So what I'm showing here on the right is a plot showing therapy response in a subsample of the current study sample showing uh, ordered from the poorest to the greatest response. I will note that roughly a third of the sample don't show a response to therapy, roughly a third show a minimal response, and then roughly a third show a large response to therapy. So my expectation was certainly not met by reality in this case. So this is really what motivates a lot of my work. So uh, with that, we, most of you are probably familiar that, or would agree that aphasia therapy does work. So where does this notion come from? Well, this notion comes from group studies, essentially. So in the same, uh, same plot, the mean improvement is pretty large. Uh, this is improvement in naming, confrontation naming, uh, and a highly significant improvement at the group level shown here, roughly uh, an, um, an improvement of six items. I'm showing this in a green line here, and I wanna note and emphasize specifically that this average improvement that is fundamental for the notion that aphasia therapy works really doesn't go very far in uh, explaining what happens at the individual level for each individual with aphasia that comes into therapy. Now, uh, there's a large literature that has addressed this or attempted to address this by examining predictors of therapy response, for example, biographical predictors, neuropsychological predictors, and you know, biological predictors, either uh, singularly or in uh, how they interact with each other. However, most prior studies have been small, have included small sample sizes. And when you pair this with the large variability, the result is that there have been very few generalizable findings that have emerged in this literature. Now, as a consequence, prognostication in uh, aphasia is notoriously difficult and specifically Clinicians and researchers alike struggle with addressing the questions of who responds to therapy and to what degree. Now, the second question has been studied pretty extensively and, and is typically the subject under study in, these, um, in this research literature, whereas the first question has not been studied extensively or almost not at all. I'm not going to go into why, why that is at the moment, but I'm happy to address that as a question after the talk. But where I'm going with this essentially is that these two 
questions are fundamental for uh, the development of personalized aphasia therapy, which seeks to maximize language gains for each individual with aphasia. So these questions are very motivational for the current uh, study, which addressed two explicit aims. First, to identify baseline characteristics that predict whether or not an individual with chronic aphasia is likely to respond to anomia therapy. So this is the question of who responds to therapy. And second, to identify factors that predict degree of recovery in those who respond to therapy. Which brings me to the methods. Again, uh, the data for this project comes from the POLAR trial, which was recently completed. Uh, this trial has been described uh, in a few talks in this lecture series in prior seasons. Uh, I talked about it about a year ago, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly so that I am not repeating myself constantly. But for the current study, um, participants came in for a, an extensive baseline assessment at followed by a therapy period where they were randomized to one of two therapy groups, either to receive phonological therapy followed by semantic therapy or semantic therapy followed by uh, phonological therapy. And then they had outcome assessments immediately after therapy completion, uh, at one month after therapy completion, six months, and at least one year after completing therapy. So for our current study design, all potential predictors were collected at baseline prior to therapy and used to predict outcomes at each of these time points uh, separately. Now participants were recruited here in South Carolina at two sites. We recruited participants who had chronic aphasia after left hemisphere stroke, were between 21 and 80 years old, had uh, English as a primary language, were able to undergo MRI imaging and able to provide informed consent. Uh, and participants were excluded if their aphasia was too severe to reliably participate in the baseline assessments or if they had a bilateral stroke. Now, we recruited 127 participants for POLAR. 20 of these were um, stroke survivors who didn't present with aphasia at the time when they entered the study and, and they are treated as controls here. And then five additional participants were excluded for this particular study for various reasons. Uh, so that the total sample size included here counts 102 participants. And here you can see some primary characteristics of the sample. Uh, an average age of approximately 61 years, and an average aphasia severity of roughly 60 points on the Western aphasia battery uh, aphasia quotient, and the standard deviation of 22 points, so that there is a large variability in this sample. I'm going to show you um, the potential predictors used in this current study. Uh, separated by class. So the predictors used to predict outcomes here are separated into biographical data for biographical predictors, neuropsychological predictors, and neurobiological predictors. I'm not going to read through these, but this is just to give you a glimpse of how extensive or how rich the data set is. Uh, here you can see the neuropsychological data. These are basically uh, cognitive linguistics, uh, linguistic tests, including of apraxia of speech, naming, uh, aphasia severity, cognitive processing, phonological processing, semantic processing, and more. And then the neurobiological data. Uh, for this study purpose uh, included for lesion volume, lesion load, uh, functional activation, uh, functional connectivity and structural connectivity. Now, to reduce the dimensionality of the neuroimaging data, um, these 
parameters were calculated for 20 pre-selected regions of interest that have previously been shown to be important for language function. And the task-based functional activation was based on a naming task, where participants were asked to name common objects and to remain silent when an abstract image was presented. And then we contrasted activation maps um, acquired during each of these conditions to end up with a naming, naming activation map. Aphasia therapy, uh, I talked about this pretty extensively last year, but just to recap, uh, every participant got both semantic therapy and phonological therapy. And these are the therapy tasks that were applied. I wanna emphasize specifically that the purpose of POLAR is not to demonstrate the efficacy of these approaches per se, but rather to mimic what is currently um, or predominating therapy approaches in current clinical practice that have a sound research pedigree behind them. So to apply therapy that we know that works at a dose that we know works. Oh. A little bit too much. So the outcome measure applied was a naming measure, uh, specifically the Philadelphia naming test, which is a test of untreated naming in this study. It includes 175 pictures of common objects or objects with different uh, frequency of names. And the outcome was assessed as a proportional outcome. So the raw improvement from baseline to post-therapy was divided by the maximum room for improvement. Now coming back to the timeline figure, uh, the PNT was administered at baseline and then at each of the outcome assessment time points. And each outcome was calculated or an outcome was calculated for each time point and always calculated relative to baseline. As for the data analysis, uh, for the first thing, to identify predictors of who responds to therapy, a lasso binary classification was applied to classify participants as responders or non-responders based on whether their therapy response was either positive for responders or if they showed no response or a decline after therapy for non-responders. For the second thing, uh, a lasso multivariable regression was applied to predict the continuous therapy response in therapy responders. Now, the reason that the lasso approach was selected is because that there's a large pool of independent predictors being examined here, and the lasso approach allows for variable selection and prediction at the same time, which is very favorable in um, a sample such as this one, where relatively few participants are included um, in a ratio uh, to the independent predictors. And all of these calculations were performed with the GLM net package in the R software, and the lambda penalization uh, parameter was selected using tenfold cross validation. Which brings me to the fun part, the results. Starting with the general group level therapy response, we saw uh, a significant response to therapy immediately after therapy. So this is the PMG one. And at the one month and six months assessments, but the uh, response to therapy in a subsample of 38 participants that were followed at least a year after therapy, we did not see a significant therapy response at the group level. I want to come back to the individual response profiles. So immediately after therapy, and this shows on the y-axis the EMG score, again, ordered from the poorest to the greatest uh, therapy response. Uh, immediately after therapy, roughly 66% of participants were defined as therapy responders, 
Uh, at the one month outcome assessment, this number jumped to 75.5%. At the six month outcome assessment, 64% were defined as responders. And then at least one year after therapy, 63% of participants were defined as responders. Which brings me to the uh, first aim, uh, trying to predict who responds to therapy, this case immediately after therapy. Now, the way I conducted these analyses was that I uh, tried to predict the uh, or classify participants based on each uh, variable class separately. So based on biographical variables separately, neuropsychological variables, and then four classes of neurobiological variables, that being lesion load, functional activation, uh, functional connectivity, and then structural connectivity. And I'm going to share with you, in the interest of time, only the uh, strongest prediction model. So for the immediate therapy effect, the baseline functional activation uh, did the best job of classifying participants with an accuracy of 77%, a sensitivity of uh, about 95%, meaning that 95% of responders were accurately classified as such, and a specificity of 45%, meaning that 45% uh, of non-responders were correctly uh, classified by the model. Now, the strongest predictor here, the strongest positive predictor, was functional activation in the middle temporal gyrus. And the interpretation in these models is that uh, greater functional activation in the middle temporal gyrus is then associated with increased odds of a participant being classified by the model as a therapy responder. Uh, Negative beta values were identified for various uh, more frontally situated regions of the brain, including the middle frontal gyrus, the inferior frontal gyrus pars orbitalis and triangularis, and the insular region. Now, in this case, greater functional activation is associated with increased odds of a participant being classified as a non respond to therapy. So how do these results fit the prior literature? Well, increased activation or activation in the middle temporal gyrus is favorable for therapy response, whereas increased or relatively greater activation in frontal regions is not. Now we know there is, there is um, consistency in the literature in terms of the uh, temporal parietal regions in that if these regions are spared, participants are more likely to respond favorably to therapy. Now, in this case, uh, activation or greater activation in the middle temporal gyrus is correlated with uh, less lesion load in this region. So this seems to be uh, leveraging that integrity of the temporal parietal region. Now, interestingly, responders showed less activity in seven out of eight regions included in the model, and this was significant for four regions. Now, there is a literature to show that increased processing efficacy uh, is favorable for therapy response. So it may be in this case that uh, less functional activation at baseline indicates that there is greater neuroplastic properties uh, in the brain prior to therapy, which facilitates therapy response. So this is what this model seems to be leveraging. Now the one month follow-up, uh, no interpretable model emerged, but at the six month follow-up, the neuropsychological model was the strongest prediction model, yielded a, a classification accuracy of 80%, sensitivity of 95%, and specificity of 56%. And in this case, um, quite a few predictors actually were retained in the model. Uh, 
The strongest predictor was the number of semantically related errors produced on the Philadelphia repetition task. And phonological errors produced on the same task also emerged as negative predictors in this model, as well as score in, on the auditory comprehension subtest of the Western aphasia battery. Positive predictors included number of self-corrections on the naming 40 task, which is an in-house uh, naming task. Uh, for mimic errors on the naming 40, presence of apraxia of speech, phonological and mixed errors on the Philadelphia naming task, and then the number of correct items on the Philadelphia repetition task. Uh, now, in this case, more semantically related errors on the Philadelphia repetition task were associated with greater odds of a participant being classified as a non-responder in particular. And interestingly, seven out of 11 predictors included in the model were related to error production, both positive and negative beta weights. Now, in this case, in this model, the interpretation of beta weights isn't as straightforward as in the prior model I showed you. But the uh, errors made on the Philadelphia repetition task, uh, all of which were negative or had negative beta weights, were strongly negatively correlated with the overall aphasia severity. So, uh, let me see. It's a little bit too far. So this may be, this model may be taking advantage of an inverse uh, severity effect. So this may be specifically an effect of aphasia severity that is manifested through the speech production errors here. Now, at least one year after therapy, the strongest prediction model again was the neuropsychological prediction model with an accuracy of almost 86%, sensitivity of 100%, and specificity of 60%. Negative predictors included the number of mixed errors produced on the Philadelphia repetition task, a subscore on the TALSA test, which is a measure of auditory short-term memory, and then phonological non-word errors on the Philadelphia naming task. And positive predictors included two subtests of the TALSA again, and the number of correct items on the Philadelphia repetition task. So how does this fit the literature? Well, in this case, all of these predictors were significantly correlated with aphasia severity. So there seems to be a strong effect of aphasia severity for the uh, long-term prediction of who responds to therapy as well. Uh, now, importantly, all these predictors retained in this model relied on chronological processing capacity at baseline. So these tasks that were included were tasks of repetition, production errors, and auditory short-term memory. Now, there is... Uh, some literature suggesting that uh, phonological processing capacity in particular uh, is strongly associated with the long-term effects of therapy in that better phonological processing predicts better therapy outcomes. And this is actually what uh, several phonological therapy approaches take advantage of in theory or in principle. So this may be what this uh, model is indicating in addition to the aphasia severity effect. Which brings me to the second thing, predicting degree of recovery. Now, in this case, um, two model paradigms were added to the six model paradigms I described before. As before, I'm going to focus only on the strongest prediction models, but I'm going to show you the overall, um, overall results. So in this plot, we're going to see on the y-axis uh, the prediction accuracy as r squared, or the amount of variability explained by each model. And on the y-axis, you can see the time point, starting with the immediate therapy effect. So from left, to right, the bars indicate the biographical model, neuropsychological model, 
and then the four neurobiological models, uh, followed by two new model paradigms, uh, a combined neurobiological model, which is a model where the pool of potential predictors included uh, all, all neuroimaging modalities. So lesion, functional activation, functional connectivity, and structural connectivity. And then a saturated model paradigm, which is in essence a cyclical model where the predictors that were fed into this model as potential predictors were predictors that I had already identified as being associated with the therapy outcome. So this model was always uh, intended to be accurate in predicting the outcome, but was intended to select a uh, subset of variables that best predicted the outcomes. All right, so for the first uh, outcome assessment, the neuropsychological model was the strongest prediction model, accounting for about 65% of the variability. Uh, at one month after therapy, the saturated model was the strongest model, accounting for about 66% of the variability. At the six month time point, the saturated model again was the strongest model, accounting for about 63% of variability. And then at least one year after therapy, the structural connectivity model emerged as by far the strongest predictive model, accounting for uh, up to 83% of the variability in the outcomes. So you'll note that out of the single class uh, models, the neuropsychological model was the strongest in predicting the first three outcome assessments, whereas the structural connectivity model was the strongest in predicting the long-term outcome. But the saturated model or the cyclical model was uh, or yielded accurate prediction in all cases as well. So what I'm going to focus on today are the most accurate models for each time point. But in, in uh, discussing the results, I will refer to all of the prediction models. So uh, the immediate therapy effect was uh, best predicted by the neuropsychological model. And the correlation between actual and predicted outcomes was 0.82. And the model retained quite a few predictors. From uh, top to bottom, this included a subscore of the TALSA auditory short-term memory task, uh, the naming subscore on the Western aphasia battery, a, a mesh discourse measure, propositional density, the spontaneous speech subscore of the Western aphasia battery, the sentence comprehension task on the NAVS, which is a measure of uh, syntactic processing, waste matrix reasoning score, which is a measure of cognitive processing, two PALPA subscores, which is in this case a measure of phonological processing in particular, and then another uh, PALSA subscore. And these were all the positive predictors and two negative predictors were retained in the model. Those were self-corrections on the naming 40, in-house naming task, and one PALSA task. At the second time point, the saturated model accounted for 66% of variability. And this model retained fewer variables, uh, but somewhat overlapping, uh, overlapping to some degree. So you will see the TALSA subtest, uh, number of correct items named on the Philadelphia naming task, a PALPA subtest, uh, structural connectivity in the putamen and two handedness indices and ambidextrous and left handedness. I will note that there were only one or two ambidextrous participants in the sample. And the strongest negative predictor was lesion load in the middle occipital gyrus. Uh, at the six month time point, the saturated model again was the strongest model accounting for 63% of variability. Uh, and this model retained quite a few variables. Again, overlapping 
uh, a little bit with the previous model. So the strongest positive predictor was the structural connectivity of the cutamen, followed by Wernicke's aphasia, structural connectivity of the middle temporal gyrus, functional connectivity of the inferior frontal gyrus pars opercularis, number of correct items named on the naming 40 and the Philadelphia naming task, and correct items on the Philadelphia repetition task, waste matrix reasoning score, and negative predictors included lesion load in the middle occipital gyrus, participants' age at testing, and months post-onset. Um, so the final time point, the DTI model, or the structural connectivity model, was the strongest or most accurate prediction model, accounting for 83% of variability in the outcome. And in this case, the model retained five variables, structural connectivity in the angular gyrus, in the pole of the superior temporal gyrus, and the uh, middle occipital gyrus. And negative predictors included structural connectivity in the posterior insula and in the pole of the middle temporal gyrus. So, how do these results fit? Um, well, I should note that the interpretation of these model uh, beta weights is essentially the same as in any linear regression model. So a, um, a higher beta weight or a stronger beta weight is more influential and a positive one is associated with a positive therapy response and a negative one with a negative therapy response or a less positive therapy response. So how do these results fit the pre-existing literature? Well, uh, on a very positive note, therapy response was very accurately predicted uh, by the models, uh, specifically the neuropsychological variable models and the saturated models. Now, in terms of the neuropsychological models, uh, prevalent variables included or retained in models included variables that uh, were highly and positively correlated with aphasia severity. So in most cases, the interpretation of these model, these variables being retained in the models is that they are indices of aphasia severity, whether it is a naming measure, discourse, auditory short-term memory, chronological processing, syntactic processing, or speech repetition. And this is highly consistent with pre-existing literature. Cognitive processing emerged as a consistent predictor as well, and usually added to the amount of variability that was explained by these models. Now, uh, this is consistent with some prior literature, but not consistent with all prior literature. Negative predictors uh, usually included speech errors and self-corrections, which may indicate sort of the integrity of the lexical semantic word retrieval processes or the uh, lexical semantic system. So they may, in this case, indicate a breakdown in these processes. And I will note that in most cases, speech errors and self-corrections were negatively correlated with aphasia severity. So uh, the saturated models included most of the same neuropsychological variables when uh, neuropsychological variables were obtained in the models, in addition to uh, consistent predictors like the uh, inferior frontal gyrus opercularis functional connectivity. Now, functional connectivity in this region has been found to be strongly associated with favorable therapy response in uh, prior research. So this is consistent with what has been found before. Structural connectivity of the cutamen also was associated with favorable therapy response. Uh, lesion load in the middle occipital gyrus was consistently uh, a negative predictor of therapy response. Now, this is very highly consistent with references uh, suggesting that the uh, 
sparing of the temporal parietal region at large is associated with therapy response. And lesion load in this occipital region was highly and strongly correlated with lesion load in more frontally situated temporal parietal regions. Age emerged as a consistent predictor as well, and in all cases, a negative predictor. So higher age was associated with poor therapy response. Now the literature on the effects of age on therapy response is uh, not consistent at all, but some recent work, including from our lab has shown that um, age seems to be strongly or shouldn't say strongly, consistently associated with therapy response. And of uh, course measures, categorical measures like aphasia type and fluency were typically retained in the models as well. And that direction was dependent on uh, which categories served as a reference value and which variables were included in the model. But in general, the trend was that uh, more fluent speech and more fluent aphasia types seem to respond more favorably to therapy than non-fluent aphasia types. And finally, the DTI models specifically for the final outcome assessment seem to in general leverage the fact that the integrity of the intact brain tissue is important for therapy response. So greater integrity uh, facilitates better therapy response. And this is particularly true in the temporal parietal junction regions, um, as I previously noted. So in general, these results suggest that uh, aphasia severity and speech errors, perhaps, as well as the neuroplastic properties of the residual intact language network at baseline prior to therapy can be used to predict who responds to therapy and various predictors can be used to predict degree of treated recovery. Strong predictors include aphasia severity, lesion load in these temporal parietal regions, structural and functional integrity of the intact language network and cognitive processing and age emerged as, as I mentioned before, uh, co consistent but not strong predictors. But in any case, they added to the uh, predictive value of each model where they were retained. So uh, these findings are highly consistent with prior findings. But as I noted before, uh, most prior studies have included small sample sizes. So making inferences from many prior studies to a new uh, sample in a new study and into clinical practice as well um, has maybe not been a feasible option. Whereas the primary novelty of the current study lies in the larger sample size. So this study includes a much larger sample than uh, most prior studies that have looked at uh, predictors of therapy response in chronic aphasia. So I would uh, emphasize that the fact that these findings are consistent with prior literature is very positive. And these findings should serve to, uh, as a basis or foundation for subsequent a priori hypothesis testing in uh, later studies. So finally, this work, uh, this particular study, uh, this part of the polar project is highly clinically motivated. And the intention with this project is to facilitate the development of personalized solutions to aphasia therapy essentially to improve the clinical management of aphasia. Now, this means that therapy uh, planning, therapy uh, or treatment for aphasia in general should be uh, focused on 
maximizing language gains at the individual level. Now, for this to become a reality, therapy planning uh, or prognostication needs to be uh, founded in some level of confidence of the outcome. So a clinician has to be able to perform prognostication uh, with some degree of confidence of how the participant, how the client is going to respond to that particular therapy. So um, for this study and similar studies, specific predictors need to be translated into clinical terms. So this study aimed to understand therapy response in chronic aphasia. So take a step back and reevaluate many of the questions that have been asked before, but do so in a larger sample. Whereas moving forward, specific predictors should be translated into clinical terms to uh, facilitate the development of improvements in clinical practice. Now, positive takeaways from this study uh, are that baseline data can be used to predict therapy response fairly accurately. Oh. a little bit too far. Uh, another takeaway is that multimodal prediction reduces bias. So these are the saturated models. So combining uh, variables from different variable classes, combining neuroimaging data, uh, for example, lesion data and functional uh, imaging data with biographical variables and neuropsychological variables leads to accurate prediction, but future studies need to um, come up with um, an ideal solution here, an ideal model that is applicable in uh, different study samples and in clinical practice with reliable results. Now, um, I want to acknowledge that even though a lot of factors were examined here, uh, a lot of baseline variables were evaluated. Other factors obviously need to be considered as well because aphasia is a multifaceted disorder and therapy response is highly variable. So other factors that need to be uh, considered in future studies include genetic components, leukoariosis, and in particular, the therapy type, which is an often overlooked factor. We recently published a paper where we looked at predictors of two different types of impairment-based aphasia therapy uh, in the same study sample, so predictors of semantic and phonological therapy, and the results showed that for one, uh, participants seemed to respond better to one therapy than the other, and second, that the specific predictors of response to each therapy are not the same or not consistent regardless of what therapy is applied. So future studies should focus on what therapy approach works for whom and how this um, resolves some of that individual variability. So with that said, and finally, my intention, my hope with this data and these results is to be able to develop at least some sort of beta value of a prediction model that can be used in different study samples in a meaningful way to predict uh, who responds to therapy and to what degree. Uh, and then to validate that in, in a different study sample and hopefully use as a foundation for other studies by other groups, which would be the ultimate validation and a huge leap forward for the field in general. So with that, uh, I want to conclude the talk by thanking all of my wonderful collaborators, mm, some of which are included in this slide, not all of them. Uh, specifically thanking participants and their families. This work obviously wouldn't be possible without their contribution. And I want to thank our master students as well for their diligent work in transcribing and coding all of this data. And open up the floor to questions.
Okay, thank you very much, Sikfus. That was well done. Nice job. Um, audience is applauding right now, but you can't hear that. So uh, we have a number of questions lined up for you in the chat box. So I will read those out. Um, I don't know if you can see them on your screen, Sikfus, but uh, I'll read them out anyway. And um, the first one is from Grant Walker. Uh, this is about the use of uh, percent maximal gain. So he's throwing down the glove. Um, for those uh, people who are interested in this, in this uh, topic, um, I can direct you to our own CSTAR website as well, where we have a couple of blogs that are dealing with this issue. So Grant Walker asks, uh, are there other contexts in science or industry where percent maximal gain is used to measure change? For example, I might ask for five gallons or half a tank of gas, but I've never asked for 50% of the remaining space in the tank and then leave it up to them to guess how much that is in gallons. Likewise, we do not know if 50% PMG is two items or 50 items. I am not aware of any standardized tests that recommend reporting change scores as PMG. I'm pretty sure insurance companies would not accept this as a valid measure for reimbursement. So what is the advantage here of calculating statistics from numbers that refer to unknown quantities. Why not use raw change so that the numbers are directly interpretable? And he has a follow-up. A lot of typing by Grant today. There you go. Follow-up question. If the baseline performance is included in your outcome measure, the denominator, as is the case for PMG, right? Isn't it possible that your models are simply predicting the baseline performance and largely ignoring the change in the numerator? There's much more variance in the baseline variable than the change variable. And that was the end of the question. So this is, this is obviously a very fair question and, and a question we have discussed many times before. Uh, and this, I mean, I would begin by acknowledging that this is not a perfect approach by any means. I am completely aware of that. The rationale is simple. The rationale is to provide some sort of, some sort of adjustment for baseline performance. Now, as Grant points out, this is not a perfect adjustment for baseline performance and as a field, I don't think we actually have a perfect adjustment for baseline performance. However, uh, baseline performance, again, like Grant mentions, is very variable. And when you add that variability in baseline performance to the variability in therapy response, uh, you end up with, with a lot of variability on, on multiple fronts that needs to be accounted for somehow. At least we need to attempt to account for it. So if we look at the raw improvement only uh, and we compare somebody who improves by two points versus somebody who improves by mm, 50 points, there really is no adjustment for, for baseline there. Uh, now, this approach is commonly used in, in the motor stroke literature, for example, but criticized there for the same reasons. It tends to inflate progress for those that have a, that score or perform well at baseline. So if somebody uh, scores 171 points on the PMT at baseline and then improves by two points, that would mean that their proportional improvement is 50%, right? Whereas if somebody scores 75 points at baseline and improves by two points, that is a 2% improvement. So this is not a, this is not a, a perfect approach by any means. But my, my way of uh, doing, making the best of this is to run all analyses currently on this proportional outcome and on the raw outcome as well. So all of these models were run for 
raw outcomes as well. Uh, the results are largely consistent, but the raw outcomes do not seem to yield the same sensitivity in a sense to, uh, to predictors. So much fewer predictors emerge, but when they emerge, they are the same predictors as are strongly associated with the uh, proportional outcome. I know this may not be the perfect answer to Grant's question. I know you've discussed this numerous times before and will again, but this is my best solution at the moment. Okay, we have two brief uh, follow-ups on that. And after that, I want to move to a different topic. But so Grant says baseline performance can be used as a predictor of raw change. So basically, he suggests to add it as a covariate, right, or uh, as a as a as another predictor actually yeah. uh, in the model. And then Kirana Tsapkini uh, says PMG adjusts for very high baseline performance if we stratify by baseline performance in groups, low, median versus high. Wouldn't that provide more reliable estimation of the treatment effect and more personalized at the same time? So that's a another approach. Deb. No, I I agree with uh, the later comment, and and I'm actually a big advocate of subsampling and and stratifying samples in in aphasia therapy trials. But the problem is generally that uh, sample sizes uh, are hardly large enough to justify stratification. So you're losing, losing a lot of power in many cases by stratifying the sample. But I think that is a, an optimal solution moving forward. Yes, I think that would prevent uh, a lot of these problems, or at least not prevent them, but help to remediate them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Kirana. Uh, I am a little... Uh, at unease with the lasso method because there may be some predictors which just do not make it to be selected, only just, right? But we do not know that due to the global R squared, all factors together. Isn't that a conceptual problem with lasso? And if so, how can it be remediated? Uh, yes, that is a very valid concern. So the lasso approach really selects the strongest subsample of predictors and um, what predictors or how many predictors are retained depends on the penalization. So in this case, the penalization parameter was selected with a cross-validation method. So um, took the step to really make the results as reliable as possible. So the more the model is penalized, the fewer uh, factors are retained in the model, and the less the model is penalized, the more predictors are retained. Now, there's always the chance that, that a variable that is uh, in a univariate approach significantly associated with the outcome is not uh, selected for the model. But in this case, I would think uh, that is fine because the intention is to identify the best subsample of uh, independent variables that predict the outcome. So what variables together lead to the most accurate prediction as opposed to which variable uh, or, or counting up all of the variables that are associated with the outcome. Now with that said also, uh, I ran several other analyses for the for this project, and and one of these was to look at just simply um, the correlation and the univariate association between each outcome variable and each independent variable. So, since this uh, project was intended to understand therapy response, as opposed to creating a model that would solve all of the problems of the literature. Uh, this, uh, these analyses were included as well, but just not reported here today. But I, I think this is a very valid concern with the method. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Davida Fromm. Uh, what were the participants doing in terms of therapy, aphasia groups, etc., from week 12 to the one-year time point? So 
during your maintenance phase? Mm -hmm. uh, there, that was, there was no particular control for that. Some of them I know for a fact include, uh, participated in our aphasia therapy groups, but there was no restriction on whether they could do any outside therapy or uh, attend any groups or use any uh, computer applications to try to improve their speech on their own. But to the best of our knowledge, we tried to, well, let me back up. Everybody got the same treatment and they were free to do whatever they wanted to in the meanwhile. So it is certainly possible that some people sought more treatment whereas other, others didn't do anything. And, and this is not accounted for here. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question in there. Uh, if we are able to predict with some degree of success, who would be most likely to respond to particular therapies? What would you suggest we offer to individuals who are not predicted to respond to therapy? And there's a follow-up to that by Maria Ivanova. Adding to the last question by Dirk regarding not recommending treatment to patients who based on our models will be deemed as non-responders. From the perspective of clinical practice, wouldn't it be more important to focus research efforts on comparing response to different treatments approaches as you have done in your recently published paper? Because mm -hmm. then the purpose of prediction would be to more accurately triage patients and allocate clinical resources. Well, the short answer would be yes and yes. I think, I mean, the, the main reason why the literature sort of refrains from addressing this question, I think, is, is related to the first comment. So what should you do if, if you are accurately able to predict who is unlikely to respond to therapy? Uh, how are you supposed to handle that information from an ethical standpoint and in clinical practice? But I would respond to that that, I think at present, this is a research question. I don't think this is a clinical question at the moment. I think as a field, we need to uh, do something along the lines of the uh, second comment. We need to start by addressing with, with some sort of uh, impairment-based therapy, uh, whether it is phonological, semantic, venous, or, or any particular therapy paradigm, who is likely to respond to this therapy and who isn't likely to respond to this therapy. And I think in that sense, uh, it's equally important who isn't likely to respond to this therapy. But then the question becomes, uh, like Maria mentioned, what sort of therapy does work for these participants in particular? So that really is the important question uh, as our, our recent work suggests that I mean, there are some participants that only respond to one therapy paradigm, but don't seem to show a response to the other therapy paradigm. So the question really is who responds to which type of therapy at the moment? Uh, so I want to reiterate that the question or, or the intention is not to try to uh, justify that somebody shouldn't receive therapy. It's the complete opposite. It's to try to personalize therapy to figure out how we can maximize language gains for somebody who is unlikely to respond to a particular therapy approach. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Sophie Roberts. Were you able to consider participants' motivation levels and or social support in continuing to practice therapy strategies outside of the trial period? Yeah, that's a very, very important and interesting question. Uh, no, we do not have any measure of motivation and social support. Well, we are collecting some data on social support at the moment, I should mention, but for this particular project, no. Uh, it is obviously a topic worth pursuing, but it is hard to measure accurately. It is always a little bit subjective and, and this is intended to be as objective of a measure as, as possible or, or as objective of a design as possible. Uh, 
But I think it's obvious to anybody, at least anybody with a clinical background, that participants' motivation and their social network is going to play into how well they do with therapy. And really just uh, participants who come into these studies are those that are probably more likely to be motivated to pursue uh, their therapy progress and or have the social network to support them in going to therapy because we have family members that drive participants to therapy. We have participants coming from far away, uh, staying in a hotel for the therapy period, which uh, is six weeks and coming back for numerous outcome assessments. So we know that the participants, most of which were coming into the study, are pretty motivated to, to actually try to improve their language. So that really is, is I think, as much as I, I can say about that. But it's an interesting question and a question that is hard to measure, but is something that needs to be considered as well. Thank you. Um, I had a, a last question and it has a follow-up as well. As negative predictors of therapy response that you listed in AIM2, um, you list speech errors and self-corrections together. However, the latter would typically be a good sign, right? Uh, showing error awareness. So do you mean multiple attempts at correcting the same speech error here? Or is it really the case that speakers who have self-corrections are predicted to have a lower therapy response? And there's a follow-up by Kristen Nunn. Let me go to that. Also adding to Dirk's question on self-correction, can you expand on your measure of self-corrections? I am curious whether self-corrections included incorrect and correct self-corrections, and if this measure took into account how many speech errors a participant made. Uh, yes. So self-corrections, I think this is a very valid question. Self-corrections in this particular context is a relatively crude measure. These are self-corrections on the uh, naming 40 task here. And the self-corrections are not required to lead to a correct response. So one of the main, uh, one of the main reason why self-corrections probably emerge as a significant negative predictor is that it is confounded with aphasia severity and with non-fluent aphasia in particular. So if somebody has severe apraxia of speech or severely non-fluent speech um, and produces a phonemic error or several phonemic errors and attempts a self-correction, that would be counted as a self-correction for this particular measure. So it's not a very sensitive measure. It's highly confounded with severity. It's highly confounded with aphasia type, uh, and it's inversely related to severity in that sense. Uh, now we have data to look at it in, in greater detail, uh, specifically self-corrections or corrections on the Philadelphia naming task, for example. Uh, but these were not included here uh, whereas a fine-grained analysis of those might really fall better in line with theories of semantic or lexical semantic word retrieval. I think this is more of a, more of a proxy measure for severity and aphasia type, to be honest. Yeah, right. So I, I, I agree. I think it, it would probably make sense to do something like what Kristen Nunn suggests, right? At least take into account incorrect versus correct. But maybe yeah. the easiest thing to do already would be at least to, to consider self-corrections relative to the number of errors, right? Yeah. You don't make a self-correction if you don't make an error, but you don't always make a self-correction if you make an error. Sure. And, 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 I mean, and that's the relevant part. Uh, it is. And we've talked about that before. And yeah. that would be an interesting next step. Thank you. That uh, ends our question session, Sigfus. Great job. And thank you uh, to the audience for your questions. Um, we have some more compliments to you, uh, Sigfus, in, uh, in the chat box. Uh, thanks for attending, everybody.
And uh, in two weeks' time, we'll be listening to Lisa Johnson. So we're looking forward to that and hope to see you then at noon um, in two weeks' time. Bye-bye.